Well, thank you very much for uh, being just about sober enough to stay on this uh, late talk. Um, having heard lots of very kind of physically engaged talks um, uh, this evening, I feel like I've kind of constructed a strange kind of ivory tower for myself um, <laughs> who's not really going to engage very closely with politics. But I hope it will uh, bring a different perspective to things, as we'll see. So, as someone who works on architecture, I work on towers a lot, and most of the time I think about towers from um, below, as we see them in this wonderful detail of a, um, a miniature by Jean Fouquet. But I have two young daughters, and recently I've been visiting various cities, um, and the one cultural thing we're allowed to do, or I like to get away with with them, is climbing towers. The Dome of Peters, the Geraldo of Seville, they love it. And this is made me reflect, really, on the strange practice of climbing towers. As I sort of puff my way up these sweaty, um, uh, smelly spaces, um, I, it, it sort of occurs to me what a strange thing it is that we do. We go to um, uh, cities and we feel compelled to climb up these uh, tall buildings. Um, and once we, so we kind of breathe these um, uh, wonky staircases, we go up those, oh, this is St. Peter's, it's so sweaty in the summer, I don't we've done it, really horrible. And at the top, we're obsessed with kind of taking selfies. Here is, uh, I think that's Hugh Jackman, who obviously didn't sweat on his way up uh, the Empire State Building. But what a strange practice it is. Um, and my question today is in part, why do we do that? Um, but also, how long have people been doing that? And the uh, why, I think, is, um, well, you can think of uh, uh, many reasons. One, I think, is simply that these buildings present a kind of challenge to us. Um, we enjoy going up and in, in, uh, counting stairs, like what my daughters like doing, and that's what a lot of um, uh, late medieval travellers like to do. Um, there's uh, a kind of triumph that you feel when you get to the top. And then, of course, what you also have is this vista over the city. You can take pleasure in the miniaturisation of buildings and people that you see below, um, and also um, uh, gain a new kind of perspective on the city and a new understanding of it. And it's, I think there's something potentially quite special in that kind of aerial perspective, one that we've maybe lost today where we're used to um, looking out of plane windows and sort of seeing um, uh, cities from afar, but this in the Middle Ages, which is what I'm here to really focus on, and right up to the uh, modern period, is something that's rather rare and rather special. So my question is, um, how far back can we trace this, and, um, and why do people do it? And I want to, um, uh, first of all, make a distinction when thinking about um, when people have done this, because uh, really, as far back as you can imagine, people have been climbing to high places, often to get closer to God. And you can see um, a, a few instances of this uh, in these very different uh, paintings. Um, uh, and uh, there is also a long tradition of people um, uh, appreciating nature. Um, Petrarch famously wrote uh, a letter, which seems to be a bit of a kind of, uh, uh, kind of early humanist construct, if you like, um, that he was the first person since, an since antiquity to climb a mountain. He climbed Mount Van Two in Provence, actually not particularly high or impressive, but he, he was very pleased with himself. And he wrote his letter to one of his um, uh, Italian correspondents talking about the fact that you know, he's really the first person since antiquity to climb a mountain, just for the sheer pleasure of it. Um, um. But um, I want to start uh, thinking about this problem with Paris. Um, for two reasons. One, because Paris um, uh, seems to have a long tradition of, kind of interest in these aerial views. Think about um, uh, experiments with um, a hot air balloon or the Eiffel Tower. But also, of course, because recent very uh, tragic events have called uh, attention to Paris and to the, the state of Notre Dame and its place within the city. Um, so I started really to famously looking at Notre Dame a little bit and thinking about um, when people started climbing those towers. And I suspect that quite a, few, a lot of you, like me, have climbed those towers, maybe with students, um, uh, maybe with friends or family. Um, and the earliest reference I can find to people climbing these towers is from a description of Paris in 1434, um, in which the author says that the number of steps um, up to the top of the towers is equivalent to the number of days in the year, so 365. Doesn't quite, um, <laughs> days in the year. Um, uh, so this 
I presume means, he doesn't actually say time the Tapas, but I think he must have. Um, uh, almost 60 years later, another uh, traveller, Hieronymus Munzer, um, a German doctor, uh, records that he climbed the Tower in Notre Dame in 1495 and looked out over the city. And in fact, Munzer, who leaves us, he's left us a, a very detailed description of his travels across Europe, seems to be an obsessive tower climber. And so I have a list. In six months, um, he climbed the towers of Barcelona, Granada, Valencia, Zamora, Toledo, Lisbon, Salamanca, Guadix, Saragossa, and Seville. Um, a hugely impressive amount of climbing and of travelling in an age before Interrail and everything else. Um, but it's this last one, Seville, that I really want to um, uh, look at uh, for the rest of this talk. Um, because, oh, here we are. Here's a nice uh, image of uh, Notre Dame on a Cartier Bresson, a nice uh, sort of a staged photo, I think, of, of people looking out over the city, and a slightly earlier one, and which gives us a sense of, you know, we always see these images of Notre Dame in the city, uh, uh, in the cityscape, but actually, Notre Dame also offers us a new vision of the city unfurling around it. But I want to uh, turn to Seville and, and focus particularly on the Giralda, the what is now the bell tower of Seville Cathedral, but which was built in the late 12th century as the minaret for the Congregational Mosque that dominated the city of Seville, an enormous medieval city and an enormous Congregational Mosque, as you can see in this reconstruction. And the Giralda uh, was, at a time, um, I think perhaps with one exception, the tallest building in Europe. Um, it rose to um, uh, nearly 80 metres. In fact, the tallest building in Europe in the Mediterranean surpassed only by the Great Pyramid and a few of the other pyramids in, in, in Egypt. It was really uh, extraordinarily tall, but it's something that we can, again, we can kind of forget the novelty <coughs> and marvel of these uh, prodigious buildings. Um, in our uh, modern city where we were so accustomed to skyscrapers. But what's interesting is that we have an eyewitness account by Ibn Sahib al Salah, who's um, uh, very closely involved with the construction of the mosque and of the minaret. And he leaves us a very striking um, description of the minaret that I think um, uh, uh, gives us some sense of the ones that inspire the contemporaries. This minaret and scripture which is part of speech and whose mention comes first every historian has no equal among the mosques of Al-Andalus. Its lofty elevation, its firm foundations, its solid workmanship, brick construction, rare craftsmanship, and splendid appearance. It soared into the air and towered in the sky and could be seen by the naked eye a day's journey from Seville with the stars of Gemini. It was built without stairs and one ascended it by a passage wide enough for beasts of burden, people, and the custodians. So here, uh, alongside a number of quite kind of conventional terms of praise, we also have this intriguing suggestion that not only are custodians um, uh, uh, building, but also people in general. And um, so we have here the first hint that perhaps this is um, a, a structure that's being climbed, we don't know exactly by whom, but more than just the kind of um, people um, uh, kind of functionaries of the, of the uh, mosque. And I should say, incidentally, we're used to, we think about minarets as being uh, the site of the for prayer, and they are, but you don't call for prayer up here because it's way too tall, your voice would be lost in the wind. That's something that only happens when you've got modern day loudspeakers. So the call for prayer is made from one of these lower balconies. So uh, the entire upper structure really is, um, in some way, it has no function. Its real function is it's a symbol of the kind of triumph of Islam in this period. And um, that triumph, uh, at least for Seville, was relatively short lived, however, because uh, almost exactly 50 years after these great golden balls were placed at the top of the minaret, Seville was captured by Fernando III of Castile and Leon. And we have another um, very striking description of Seville by, again, an eyewitness chronicler who describes the extraordinary impression that Seville made on its conquerors uh, when they entered on Christmas Day 1248. Uh, they ent entered a huge city that was completely deserted that had been effectively conquered or, um, uh, you know, the keys been given over a month earlier. The Muslim population had a month um, to leave. They left. The city was deserted for three days. And then 
the Christian army um, marched into the city and found this huge city, uh, these extraordinary buildings, the like of which they had not seen anywhere else before, um, and encountered these, uh, uh, this town in particular. And our chronicler writes, truly the city is a magnificent one. Her walls are quite extraordinarily high and strong and thick too. The lofty towers, well positioned, most beautifully constructed. For example, the tower front of the rear, that's this, with its very fine features and great height, its roof is 60 brasses in breadth and four times the mountain height. So wide and so easy and so masterful is the construction of the stairway by which people go up to the tower that kings and queens and nobles who wish to go up it on horseback can do so right to the very top. So again here, we have this idea that people are going up for fun, basically. This is a novelty, and um, part of the fact that it's not got stairs or an internal ramp, uh, and secondly, um, they're going up to uh, enjoy the view, we imagine. And we have some um, uh, contemporary evidence of the way that this was used. Here I'm just showing you a kind of um, place filler, really, from the late 19th century, a view from the Galaba, because in another contemporary chronicle, we hear that Fernando III was taken up to the top of the tower shortly after the conquest of Seville. And he was shown the view, and he was enjoying it and thinking, oh, what a wonderful city, I can see all these Christian banners, um, uh, you know, look at my wonderful army. And then his jongleur, Paha, points to him, to a whole area of the city in which there are no um, uh, Christian banners, and says, yes, but look, this city is still very vulnerable, we were scarcely occupying the city, you need to make sure that Seville is secured, otherwise it's going to be retaken. And I think this raises an interesting question, uh, an issue about uh, views and viewing and um, uh, surveying uh, of the city, um, which is effectively what um, uh, uh, Fernando is doing. Um, and it's one that we find, again, in a pretty much contemporary account of um, uh, the autobiographical account by King James I of Aragon, um, uh, Ferdinand's brother-in-law, who describes a kind of similar experience in 1240 when he goes up to the borders of his kingdom that overlook Muslim territory to the south. And he climbs up this tower in Hatiba, um, uh, well, well, that overlooks this uh, valley. He writes, we climb the pointed hill on part of which the castle stands and beheld the most beautiful area of irrigated farmland which we've ever seen anywhere. There were more than 200 flat roofed houses scattered about, the most handsome one could wish to see, and the farmsteads all round the edge of the irrigated land, very numerous and closely set. And the castle stood there, most nobly and handsomely, overlooking the splendid farmland. Our hearts fill with pleasure and satisfaction at the sight. There's an interesting question here, I think, about the appreciation of landscape. This is a sort of long debate in, in our history about when people start becoming interested in the landscape. But of course, here, um, uh, this appreciation, this aesthetic appreciation of landscape, but also of, of, of human dwellings, is tinged for um, uh, James with his um, uh, conquering design. He wants to own this land. That's part of its uh, appeal for him. So. Um, uh, this act of, of surveillance has to do with um, uh, uh, triumph, if you like, and with acquisition. Um, but it also resonates with a, a contemporary description of the partition of, of the city of Ethica, um, also in Andalusia, which, after its conquest, had the, the another Muslim city that was conquered in the uh, 1230s, and in the 1260s it was divided up into different parishes. And we have a report saying that the, um, those who were dividing it up climbed up the top of the, top of the uh, tallest minaret and they looked over the city and they laid, they imagined the form of a cross um, uh, uh, overlaying the city and they used that in order to um, set it into four distinct parishes. So again, we see that the act of surveying um, uh, is uh, closely linked in a kind of you know, Foucaultian sense to, to the survey and to this idea of overlooking that, that just as um, you enjoy um, uh, the view, so too you possess it uh, in a sense. And I want to, um, oh, and I should add that incidentally we also know that Geralda uh, in Seville was used as a watchtower. Um, uh, and that those uh, who were in the Granada were responsible for looking across at a number of other towers, dotted across the city and then out into the landscape up to the borders with um, Muslim Granada, so that these towers form a kind of network of watchtowers um, uh, through southern Spain, uh, part of this um, machinery of surveillance, if you like. 
But I want to just uh, finish now um, by reflecting on the role of towers later in the Middle Ages. Um, for instance, um, it has been very convincingly shown that this extraordinary map of Venice, published in 1500, was made by um, surveyors who climbed the top of a series of um, uh, bell towers and then stitched together this topography of Venice as though it had been seen from the uh, Campanile of San Giorgio Maggiore. Um, so this again speaks to um, uh, the role of towers in the process of surveying. But I think it also invites us to think about um, uh, the practice of climbing towers, which is documented increasingly from the late 15th century onwards, from the, um, the rush to build stupendously tall towers, which we also think of as a late medieval phenomenon. Um, so these towers we can think of as becoming tourist attractions in their own right, um, no less than the relics that were kept uh, inside San Marco. And these, uh, again, I think we can imagine being implicated, in fact, in a whole uh, process of rethinking the way that the city was imagined uh, by offering these new perspectives on the city. Um, I think we can imagine them kind of implicated in a, in a uh, reconceptualization of space and the city, which is such a large feature of um, uh, early 16th century town planning. So this morning on the, on the radio, they were talking about the environmental costs of all of us flying. Um, and I, I want to just kind of conclude with, what it, with imagining what it would be like if we, if we stopped flying. Uh, and one of the advantages of that, apart from the environment, might be that we would rediscover some of the wonder um, that was to be had from climbing tall structures like this. Thank you.